Welcome to Domain 2 of the Security Plus Exam Cram Series 2024 edition, and here in Section 2.1 we'll talk about threat actors and their characteristics in terms of skills and funding, as well as their motivations in executing cyber attacks. In this session I'll give you everything you need to know for the exam in about 15 minutes, so let's get to it. Welcome to the 2024 edition of my Security Plus Exam Cram series, this time delving into Domain 2. And in this session, we'll focus on coverage of Section 2.1, delving into threat actors and their motivations. And the focus of Domain 2 is threats, vulnerabilities, and mitigations. And as was the case with Domain 1, in Domain 2, we're going to go line by line through the official exam syllabus touching on every topic in there. Section 2.1 asks us to compare and contrast common threat actors and their motivations. So we will look at the types of threat actors that are out there from the very sophisticated nation state to the very much unskilled attacker in a script kitty. We'll look at their attributes, whether they're inside or outside the company and their relative funding levels and level of capability or sophistication, and finally, their motivations. And I'm going to cover these in a way that will make it easy for you to map the actors to their attributes and their motivations as you prepare for the exam. So if I were to just take a high-level categorical perspective, I could look at this from a mission versus money perspective around their motivations and incentives. So if I look at money and mission, Nonprofits, those out there to improve society. Governments, it will fall somewhere in the middle with economic and political motives. Business focused attackers that are purely driven by profit. And at a high level, I could throw some examples here. Criminal enterprises are money driven. Governments tend to be somewhere in the middle. And those who are focused on their mission, on their principles, don't really care about the money. So the point is the motivations and incentives for different types of organizations will, will vary. And understanding an attacker's motivation reveals probabilities and potential impacts so you can establish priorities. So I want to begin with a walkthrough of the six type of threat actors called out in the syllabus. We have the nation state, which is a country's government that uses cyber attacks to disrupt or steal information from another country. We have unskilled attackers who are someone with limited technical knowledge who may launch attacks just out of curiosity or malice. You often hear unskilled attackers referred to as script kiddies because they're often running malicious scripts that they know very little about. We have the hacktivist. An individual uses cyber attacks to promote a political or social cause. They are mission driven. We have the insider threat an authorized internal user who intentionally or unintentionally misuses their access to harm a system or organization. An important distinction there that it's not always intentional. Organized crime, a criminal syndicate that uses cyber attacks for financial gain, such as stealing money or data. And finally, shadow IT. These are employees leveraging unauthorized or unmanaged IT resources within an organization which can create security vulnerabilities. Shadow IT employees are not exactly an actor itself, but it results in an exploitable risk. We really saw the rise of shadow IT with the rise of cloud, where employees could go out with a credit card, they could subscribe to a SaaS service like cloud storage, for example so they could more easily exchange files with parties outside the company or developers who might spin up an AWS subscription so they could quickly deploy VMs so they could get their development work done instead of waiting on IT who might take days or weeks to deploy new VMs for them. Let's shift gears and talk through the motivations just to make sure you're familiar with each on the list. So we have data exfiltration, which is unauthorized removal of sensitive or proprietary information from a computer system. Espionage, which is conducted by organizations, including nation states or corporations, typically it's 
a corporate entity we're thinking about, with the goal of stealing confidential information from another organization. Service disruption, which is aimed at causing outages or disruptions to essential services. Next, we have blackmail, attacks that threaten to expose sensitive information, often embarrassing information, unless the victim submits to a demand, typically for money or other concessions. Financial gain, where the motivation is to steal money or valuables through fraudulent activities. Political or philosophical, attacks driven by ideological or political motivations. So this motivation would clearly map back to the hacktivist who is driven by their ideological mission. Ethical hacking, which are authorized simulated attacks conducted by security researchers or ethical hackers to identify vulnerabilities in a system and improve its overall posture. Authorized for the record means it would be included in a signed contract in writing. Then we have revenge, so motivated by a desire to retaliate against an individual or organization. So retaliate meaning in response to some previous act by the other party. Generally driven by perceived wrongs, often attempting to cause public embarrassment or operational disruption. Then we have disruption or chaos, which is aimed at causing widespread disruption and hindering normal operations of a system or network. May be driven by mere personal satisfaction or it could be furthering some other agenda. So the disruption or chaos could be driven by a motive of revenge or the political or philosophical. And finally, we have war, the use of cyber attacks by military forces or civilian groups to disrupt enemy military operations and gain an advantage in an armed conflict. War waged through cyber attacks is often called cyber warfare. Now that you've been introduced to threat actors and their motivations, we're going to bring this information together along with their characteristics and capabilities and ultimately some examples, all in a tabular format to make preparation for exam day an easy task. So going down the list here, we have the nation state. High level of skill. Motivations that include espionage, disruption, and power. Motives we've seen illustrated in spy movies for many years and on the news. Organized crime, also typically high level of skill, focused narrowly on financial gain. Fraud and extortion tend to be two of their primary motivations. We have the insider threat. Now, with an insider threat, the level of skill varies, as does the intent. So with an insider threat, the common malicious intents will be financial gain or a disgruntled employee who wants to do damage. Espionage begins with an external source, and usually the aim there is to steal sensitive information like trade secrets. With the hacktivist, skill level can vary. You know, they're focused on their social or political causes. A great example of a highly skilled hacktivist organization would be the group that goes simply by Anonymous. The unskilled attacker is, of course, very low in their level of skill, and they may be out for financial gain more often. It's malice, just trying to hurt or embarrass an adversary, and often just sheer curiosity about the world of hacking. And then finally, shadow IT, where the skill level varies, but to the low end, it could be a business person just buying cloud storage so they can more easily share files. To the high end of skill, being maybe a senior developer using their credit card to buy AWS time so they could accelerate their development activity. Now, I want to go a step further and give you some examples and elaborate a bit. But do remember the insider threat and shadow IT, these are the two that are inside the organization. What these two have in common is they are generally employees. They are insiders. So to go one level deeper, I could give you some examples. So if we start with the nation state, it's really about stealing intellectual property, state secrets, we call them, from a foreign competitor. A lot of that is focused on the balance of power in the world. We have the unskilled attacker who might do something as simple as launching a phishing campaign against random email addresses. 
using a script they found on the internet or maybe that they bought on the dark web as a kit. The Hacktivist, which is a portmanteau of hacker and activist. So they might, for example, leak sensitive data from a big corporation they believe is unethical. For example, leaking the secret pollution of an oil company or animal testing unknowns to the public performed by a cosmetics company. And then we have the insider threat, who could be money-focused, selling customer data on the black market. They could be focused on leaking or exfiltrating sensitive intellectual property that result in money or maybe even their next employment. That's where we'll use a tool like a cloud access security broker to watch for mass uploads, mass downloads, potentially mass deletions. Then organized crime, a ransomware attack on a major hospital chain, for example. These organizations are very sophisticated and they know the ROI on these ransomware attacks. They do the homework, they do the math, and they pick their targets. We then have shadow IT. This could be somebody in sales creating a cloud storage account outside of IT control just so they can more conveniently share files. It could be a developer spinning up an AWS or Azure subscription so they can get VMs to work on more quickly. Employees engaging in shadow IT are really just focused on increased productivity, at least the perception of productivity, and avoiding the red tape of procuring new resources. So let's talk about the impact of skill and funding from another angle here. So how do threat actor skill and funding level impact the threat to the organization? So skill level. Highly skilled attackers can exploit complex vulnerabilities, bypass security measures, and remain undetected for extended periods of time. They can target specific systems or individuals within an organization, making them very dangerous, really. Low-skilled attackers are going to be less likely to launch sophisticated attacks for that very reason. They're going to rely on readily available tools, or they're going to exploit well-known vulnerabilities. Whereas those high-skill attackers may be coming at you with zero-day threats or very clever exploits. But even a low-skilled attacker can be dangerous if they target a vulnerable system or they trick employees into compromising security, so social engineering. Phishing attacks are cheap and easy. The ROI is good. That's why phishing attacks are so common. So if we think about it from a funding perspective, your well-funded actors like nation states, organized crime groups, they can invest in advanced tools, they can hire skilled attackers, and develop custom malware. This allows them to target a wider range of organizations and to launch more complex attacks and larger scale attacks. You're much more likely to see a distributed denial of service attack, an effective distributed denial of service attack, come from a highly skilled, highly funded group or attacker. Your low funding parties are going to rely on free or readily available tools. This will limit their capabilities, but again, it doesn't eliminate the threat. They can still exploit basic vulnerabilities or launch social engineering attacks that don't require significant resources because that's the human element at play. Three things you can do to defend against any level of funding and skill. Good patch hygiene, employee awareness training, and defense in depth, a layered defense. We know patch hygiene patches known vulnerabilities that the low-funded, low-skilled attacker could come at. Employee awareness training, teaching our employees about how to avoid falling prey to phishing emails, teaching them about social engineering so they make good decisions when they're asked to go around our processes. And layered defenses, so if those perimeter first layer Network defenses don't do the trick. Some other layer closer to our identities, our devices, and our data does stop that attack. We'll be talking about threats, vulnerabilities, and mitigations throughout Domain 2, so we'll definitely go deeper on all three. So ranking them by their relative level of danger, just the combined impact, pretty well predictable. High skill, high funded are going to be most dangerous. Low skill, low funded the least. But the combination of high skill and high funding, while it creates the most dangerous threats, 
It's really because they have the resources and the skills to develop and launch sophisticated attacks that are difficult for us to defend against. They can create some of those zero-day attacks. They can find new vulnerabilities that aren't well known. Which is why AI-driven, machine learning-driven protection out there that's based on malicious behaviors is so valuable. We can't rely on antivirus signatures anymore. But on the whole, it comes down to doing the basics. Talking to one of my friends involved in incident response in breach scenarios, she said attackers are lazy. She said we're always dealing with recovery in organizations where they don't have the basics in place, like multi-factor authentication. They're not patching their systems. They haven't configured the basic security controls around their cloud storage to rein in data leakage and oversharing. And we'll definitely talk about those basics and those best practices throughout this course. And that does it for section 2.1. I hope you're enjoying the series thus far. If you have any questions, be sure to reach out to me in the comments section below the video or ping me privately on LinkedIn. Happy to help where I can as you prepare for the exam. I'll look forward to seeing you back here for section 2.2 in the next two or three days. And until next time, take care and stay safe.